Welcome everyone to the Spark Prize in Conversation workshop. In this virtual environment, I'd like us all to take a moment to acknowledge the lands on which we are participating in this event. For me, it's on the Wurundjeri land of the Woiwurrung language group of the Eastern Kulin Nations. So please join me in acknowledging the traditional owners on whose unceded lands we conduct this event and respectfully acknowledge their elders past and present. My name is Tracy O'Shaughnessy and I'm here representing RMIT Writing and Publishing and will be guiding you through this workshop. I'm particularly thrilled to be involved with this event because it brings together my professional experience as an, one of the original members of the Hardy Grant Books team and my current role in mentoring emerging editors and writers as program manager of the Master of Writing and Publishing and publisher of the Bowen Street Press. Anyway, enough about me. Today we're here to talk about the Spark Prize, a prize that is celebrating the genre of narrative nonfiction. The idea behind this biennial prize was originally hatched between Ronnie Scott, award-winning writer and program manager of creative writing here at RMIT, and Hardy Grant Books publisher Arwen Summers. The prize itself and this event is a wonderful exemplar of industry meeting the Academy. Hardy Grant Books is sharing their professional expertise to offer an amazing developmental opportunity that fosters emerging writers of narrative nonfiction. And for student interns from the Master of Writing and Publishing, there is insight and engagement with Hardy Grant Books into industry best practice on running and administering a literary prize. So today we're going to be talking about the process of developing a budding idea for nonfiction book proposal that will grab a publisher's attention. And you'll be hearing from the following guests. Hardy Grant nonfiction publisher Arwen Summers, who has over 13 years experience in publishing and has a particular interest in narrative nonfiction. She's published authors both established and debut, such as Alana Hill, Malcolm Turnbull, Emily Clements, Clive Hamilton and Ginger Gorman. Discovering and nurturing fantastic emerging writers of narrative nonfiction is one of the highlights of her job and she's excited to be part of the Spark Prize judging panel in 2020. Uh, we'd also like to welcome writer and RMIT alumni Emily Clements, who is a Melbourne-based writer. Her non-fiction has been shortlisted for the Feminazi Memoir Prize, the Ada Cambridge Prize, and highly recommended for the Scribe Nonfiction Prize. Her fiction has been twice shortlisted for the Rachel Fenari Prize and earned the Melbourne Young Writers Award. She is a former editor for VoiceWorks and Visible Inc. And The Lotus Eaters is her first book. And finally, my RMIT, my RMIT colleague, Zoe Zunko. Zoe is a poet, editor and lecturer at RMIT's Master of Writing and Publishing. Her work has appeared in numerous Australian and international publications. As an editor, Zoe has more than a decade of experience in including including the co-editor of The Lifted Brow. In 2014, she founded Powder Keg Magazine, an online poetry quarterly based out of Melbourne and New York. I'm now going to hand over to Arwen and Zoe to give us an overview of the Spark Prize. Thanks so much, Tracy. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today to celebrate this wonderful initiative. And thank you for everyone who's made time in their day to join us. Um, at first, I'd like to um, give Arwen an opportunity to talk about some of the key ideas, I suppose, that underpin this prize and sort of what set it in motion. And then um, I'll talk about how um, our interns within the um, Bowen Street Press will be working with Hardy Grant in the facilitation of the prize and what makes that really exciting from our perspective. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for the introduction, Zoe and Tracy. Um, I'm Arwen Summers, a nonfiction publisher at Hardy Grant Books, as you know, and I am so excited to be fostering and hopefully uh, developing fantastic narrative nonfiction out of this. Narrative nonfiction is such a huge genre. I don't even know if you would call it a genre. It encompasses many genres within it. Um, and I, now that I publish only nonfiction, I have a vested interest in seeing more of this out in the world. I think it can be quite intimidating for a lot of people starting from scratch because uh, nonfiction is so broad and it is driven by the real world in some capacity rather than your, uh, you know, purely your creative imagination. So where do you start? 
you know, how do you get ideas? How do you turn an idea into a book? How do you develop this? Um, and all the different forms and varieties in which you can do that. Yeah, fantastic. And I think um, that sort of uh, gets to the heart of what I think is so exciting about uh, narrative nonfiction, but also a prize that is um, developmental and it's about sort of unearthing fresh perspectives, new voices and stories um, that are drawn from the world. Um, and so, you know, that's um, something that we really want to encourage with this prize. Um, you know, people that do have, you know, stories to tell from different backgrounds um, and especially um, people from diverse backgrounds applying for this prize and, and you know, sharing their stories um, and stories that really need to be heard. Um, and so from our perspective, um, and as Tracy has mentioned, um, this is a, a developmental prize for um, emerging or established voices in long form narrative nonfiction, but it also sees our interns within um, the Bowen Street Press working under the guidance of Hardy Grant to sort of facilitate the prize. And this excites me so much because um, like all creative industries, publishing is an ecosystem. Um, so just as the Spark Prize just supports the development of new works, um, it also presents an opportunity for our next generation of editors and publishers to gain really invaluable experience working with one of Australia's most vibrant and innovative uh, independent publishers um, learning sort of from the best and having a hand in, um, you know, as having a hand in these uh, these new vital works, you know, seeing seeing light and, and making their way into the world. So that's um that's what's so wonderful about this that um supporting both sides of that really rich ecosystem. So thank you very much, um, Arwen. That was uh, lovely to hear the background of the prize and really excited for this workshop. Um, fantastic. Um, thanks to you both and absolutely what an extraordinary um, opportunity the Sparks Prize is. I'm just going to give you a little overview as to um, how the event will unfold. Firstly, we're going to do um, some contextualising and looking at the question of what exactly narrative nonfiction is. We're going to try and nut that out, um, what it is and what it can do. And then next, Arwen and Emily will give us some insights into the development and publication of The Lotus Eaters. After that, we'll move into the, the workshop proper, where we'll discuss the key elements of the submission and talk about where ideas come from and what publishers are looking for in the proposal. So we'll, we'll cover how to tackle the synopsis, the chapter outline and the sample chapter. Um, and along the way, you in the audience can be gathering um, tips for making your submission stand out. And then last but definitely not least, we'll have some time for audience questions at the end. However, during the session, please use the chat for any questions you have as, as they come up and as they occur to you. Um, my colleagues, uh, Zoe Zunko and Ronnie Scott will be on hand to uh, manage the questions from you and they'll try to respond to as many as possible. We're also going to collate these questions and respond to any queries in an FAQ and that will be put up on the Spark Prize page on the Hardy Grant website and as well on the Bowen Street Press website. All right, now that we've got all the administrative bibs and bobs out of the way, let's start. And let's start with at the beginning with one of the most important questions. So Arwen, from your perspective, and I know you talked about this briefly before, but um, what, what do we mean when we say narrative nonfiction and how would you describe the genre? That is a great question. Um, it's also a hard Large. question to answer because it's <laughs> massive. Um, yeah. I guess the first thing to note is that, uh, you know, broadly speaking, you have narrative nonfiction and you have experimental nonfiction. Um, experimental nonfiction is, is uh, on all its ways. Um, narrative nonfiction encompasses experimental nonfiction, but for the purposes of uh, me as a book publisher, I publish narrative nonfiction with a goal to publish something out into the world that is tends not to be experimental in that way. We're mm -hmm. looking at uh, memoir. It could be um, memoir, investigative journalism, uh, yeah. one of those wonderful hybrid memoirs, which is kind of hard to describe, but I feel like that's what I read so much of. Um, it could be cultural critique, it could be something encompassing society and culture, it can be, um, Tracy, I'm having a, you know this as well as I do. There's, yeah, there's, no, I mean, it's, there's, you can uh, just there's keep going. Different, different categories and that's absolutely right. Probably one of the things I think is really interesting about the genre though is to, is to talk about what, 
what does the genre do that sets it apart from straight nonfiction? So what is it? What is it that we think is are the characteristics that do that? That's it. That is an excellent point. It's really you know narrative describes it to me. You were talking about taking people on a journey. Uh, on a narrative arc, it's not a book that will be broken up into subheads with lots of informational information there. It's not a practical book. It's not a cookbook. It's not a book about how to grow a um, beautiful balcony garden or anything like that. Yeah. You are taking people on an experience in, in which it has similarities with fiction. So if you think about what you love about fiction and the way that you are introduced to characters and you follow their experiences over the course yeah. of that book, narrative nonfiction has many of the same characteristics. It's just that you're dealing with real people and real events. Yeah, fantastic. I think that is that is incredibly helpful because I know that there is that sort of, you, you're looking at a book and you think to yourself, I mean, I do it all the time. Is it is this narrative nonfiction or is it straight fiction? And and it can be quite it can be quite hard to make those distinctions. But I think thinking about the it in terms of the character development, the kind of all the sorts of fictional elements that bring to come bring to bear. I wanted to bring Emily in at this um at, at this stage. And Emily, what about how? Were there any books that you thought about or were looked into as you were um, developing your your proposal? And, and what did you think about this genre as you were kind of developing? Uh, so I came into writing a memoir very ill-equipped to write a memoir, <laughs> uh, which I'm sure is probably a feeling that a lot of people uh, at this event will share. Uh, there's not really a specific roadmap of how you kind of find yourself in this position. Yeah. Um, I found that I often reached to examples of literary fiction with a really strong voice and a really strong yep. narrative. Um, and I found that those were often just as helpful, if not more helpful than traditional examples of nonfiction or narrative nonfiction, uh, of which the canon is often, uh, well, at least the ones that I looked at, well, my understanding, at least when I first started research was nonfiction as very, very much being the domain of someone with uh, more quote unquote experience, uh, someone who was older and more well versed in the world. And of course, that's still uh, an attitude that gets reflected back to me when I tell people that, you know, at, in my 20s, I've written a memoir. <laughs> oh, what, have you, what have you lived? What have you seen? Uh, but, you know, I think that, you know, for that reason, it's, it's important uh, to narrow down on memoir as reflective of a like a time and experience and like no matter how yeah. old you are or where you come from um, uh, that there is something that you can add and talk about yeah um, I looked at uh, I remember looking at uh, well I looked at um, Karen Blixen's um, I think it's out of Africa mm -hmm. uh, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend but just because it, uh, <laughs> because it played with form uh, in a yeah. way that I, and it kind of gave me permission to move away from, I thought of nonfiction as being very structured with all the chapters, you know, covering a particular topic and being of a, of a particular length. Yeah. Um, whereas that and also um, Kim Tui's Rue uh, is a really great example of, that's more fiction, I believe, um, of working through vignettes and, I mean, it's an example of looking at uh, examples of the form that, you know, give you permission or kind of show how you can be different and you can play with like length, for example, with chapters like in the Lotus Eaters, uh, a lot of my chapters are quite short and then others are yeah. long. And there's not really much in the way of rhyme or reason of them. Um, but seeing other writers doing that as well meant that I felt confident in using that in my own work. In what you were doing. Yep, fantastic. Okay, I, I think that we, we're going to have to agree that narrative nonfiction is huge and there's a, an, an incredibly wide definition of what it is. But um, we'll also have some some really nice examples of um, narrative nonfiction which will pop up in the FAQs as well so that you can start to look at um, all the different types of areas and everything that it's published into. So thank you both for that. Um, and now I think what I'd love to do is just at this early stage is to um, 
is for Arwen and Emily to talk a little bit about the development of the lotus eaters and give us some insights into this process. And so basically, um, from the proposal to the finished copy, we won't we won't take the whole thing because that would be the entire um, part of the workshop that we've got left. But it might be really interesting just to talk about those initial initial stages. But before I do that, Emily, would you like to just read us a little section from the Lotus Eaters to introduce this part of the talk? Um, of course. So I was I chose this excerpt thinking about um, my approach to narrative nonfiction and what I found that it could um, that found what it allowed me to explore that I didn't. It, initially kind of expect. So, mum tells me a story. It's the 80s and she's in her 20s traveling the world. There is a photo of her at this time where she has silky duck hair and pixie cut, her slender body swimming in a turtleneck sweater. It is the image I carry into this story. She was walking along an empty road in a city whose name she can't remember. I think of red dust and gray stone. A group of men were walking the same road and spotted her by herself. One detached from the group. He swaggered over. He asked for a kiss. Mum, shocked, said no. They argued. It escalated. She slapped him. She tells me that he looked like he wanted to kill her. His eyes were murder. She picked up a rock. He picked up a rock. They stared at each other. The group of men his friends watching the road empty, dusk falling. She dropped the rock, he kissed her. As she tells me the story, she admonishes herself. Stupid, she says, stupid to pick up that rock. I wanna reach through time and join her on the road. I want to hold her hand and my own rock, so it is us together against the world. I want to pull her from that lonely place where the line is drawn, not at the skin, but beyond it, around other, more vital organs. I want to protect her. I know that this impulse is partly about protecting myself. If mum hadn't had to kiss that man, would the word no come any easier to me? If she hadn't dropped that rock, could I have picked one up? The heartbreaking thing is that she's right. It was stupid. A woman is taught to measure risk. She is taught the value of certain behaviors. In a moment like that, with the empty road, and the ringing sky and the rock clenched in her fist, mum had to balance how much she was willing to pay for what she wanted with how much it was actually worth. Fantastic. Thank you, Emily. Um, excellent. Okay. What um, I think we're going to get stuck into the proposal and we're going to talk, we're going to get Emily and Arwen to sort of talk through the various stages of the, um, the publication process uh, through kind of talking through um, the, the different parts of the, the book proposal. Now, first things first, I just want to remind you all that the submissions close at 11.59 on the 16th of October. Um, and the, the things that we need you to, that you must include in your proposal is a one page synopsis, a chapter outline, a maximum of 3,000 words, and a sample chapter, a maximum of 5,000 words of your work in progress. So, the, Emily, tell us, the very first thing that we have to think about with a, with a narrative nonfiction process is where do we get the ideas from? How do we find them and where do we get them? So can you tell us a little bit about the origin of the Lotus Eaters and how that idea came to you? Uh, so I started off with a quite a, a totally different draft, uh, none of which made it into the um, final manuscript that I submitted to Hardy Grant Books. It yeah. was a patchwork of uh, emails that I had written to friends and family back home. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, had received, like, you know, I felt that they were funny and that they had a story. Uh, and I thought, oh, I can string these together and fill in the gaps. And that's a, and that's a manuscript, right? Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> five years later, I found that that was a very uh, naive um, approach to it. But what I found also is that the tone and the voice completely changed. So right. uh, what I put down in that initial draft uh, was very self-deprecating and kind of inviting people to laugh with me uh, because mm -hmm. I anticipated that 
um, there would be a certain, my experiences would be viewed with a certain skepticism or uh, light, lightness. And so I felt that if I wrote it in that way, I would be uh, preempting a, a response that I felt was inevitable. But what over the course of uh, bringing, so I brought that manuscript into the associate degree of professional writing and editing. And through uh, consistently workshopping that with uh, peers and teachers, um, I found that the response was different to what I had anticipated. It was more like, oh, well, this is, there is substance here. You should treat it seriously. Um, mm -hmm. And I initially, like, I had tried to supplement my own experience with uh, a cli fi experimental element uh, where <laughs> I, I envisioned that I would have this timeline that was a thousand years in the future. Um, and that would, and events in the future would correspond with events in the present that were non-fiction. So it would be non-fiction, but also fiction. Right. Um, and, but my, the feedback from my teachers at PWA was, was consistently that maybe you don't need to stretch so far. <laughs> um, actually, you know, the memoir is in and of itself, uh, can hold its own weight. Has um, its own, yeah. I found that, yeah, absolutely. And what... I was reaching for in the like a thousand years in the future in this imagined timeline was actually contained in my adolescence. Uh, and so I needed to reach backward instead of projecting forward into an entirely different genre and bring <laughs> that into the story in a way that uh, contextualized that timeline in Hanoi. Uh, absolutely. And um, one of the things that you're talking about there is extensive redrafting and, and thinking about um, what the book has is doing and what and where the book is going to go. So um, and I just wondered at what point did did you guys, did Hardy Grant or you um, see the manuscript or and start interacting with Emily around finding voice and, and finding what the story would be? To be honest, Tracy, there was already a hell of a story and a hell of a voice on the page by the time it got to me. And I think yep. that touches on something that's really important for uh, people who have an idea or even a manuscript in progress, yep. being able to reach out to whether it's a creative writing course like at RMIT or whether it's a workshop where you can actually talk about your ideas with other writers. I know, Emily, you said to me that you found it incredibly valuable in terms of finding your voice and also coming to terms with some of the more personal stuff in your book, being able to share it with other writers. Is that right? Is she on mute? Maybe not. Anyway. I am um, on mute. Sorry. Yes. So it was, okay. It was incredibly valuable um, to, you know, bounce, bounce ideas out and, and see which ones landed uh, instead of just assuming that they were all awful or they were all fantastic, which was kind of this, um, you know, polar extremes that I tended to, and I think quite a few writers tend to um, fluctuate towards, is either your work is the most amazing, perfect thing that you've ever written or it's a pile of steaming shit and there's absolutely nothing worth saving. <laughs> so finding that like middle ground and knowing that there's value in everything and things that you can pull out and put together and restructure in a way that brings out like their inherent value was, yeah, definitely um, a really valuable thing about the course. Yeah. I don't think you need to, you know, you can also just have a trusted friend who you can send it to or somebody that you feel safe sharing your writing with. Um, but to come back to your question, Tracy, I actually encountered Emily at a pitching session for the Emerging Writers Festival. Oh, um, interesting. She came and, and sat down in front of me and it was a five-minute speed dating type situation, which is always interesting. Yeah. And she uh, was able to articulate really clearly um, within this very constrained face-to-face -face awkward situation exactly what the book was about and then handed me over a little one-page synopsis after that and walked off into the sunset. And that really piqued my interest. And yep. I, I liked the contrast between um, the way that Emily presented herself and then what, what was on the page, which sounded like this quite explosive uh, memoir. And I really wanted to know more. So I guess in that case, it was the interaction between actually meeting Emily and seeing what was on the page. But 99% of the time, I don't meet an author when I'm reading a synopsis or reading a picture or reading an idea. Um, it was just that particular circumstances of that one. 
I think it was uh, at the time Me Too uh, was in the backdrop of my mind mm -hmm. and it felt like everybody was scrambling around and looking for Me Too manuscripts and quickly yep. rushing out manifestos on feminism. And I really loved the fact that the book uh, was not, I don't, I don't think, Emily, you might correct me on this, certainly I don't think there was ever Me Too in, your, in the foreground of your mind when you were writing this book because it happened you were writing the book over five years and it was experiences that predated that but it really touched on issues around consent and self-worth and what it's like to be a young woman in the world that I thought were so interesting and had really come to the world's attention at that moment in time and I thought this is a completely different take on it and it's not hashtag me too in your face it's really exploring it in a much more subtle and interesting way. Fantastic. And and that probably speaks to how you pitch that to the acquisitions team um, at Hardy Grant Books, which, you know, is clearly an important part of, of taking any book for to that next step, step. Yeah, that's right. I actually dug up my original memo that I took um, and there was no mention in there of me too. I had clearly just I think it was in the other at that time. It was it was really a coming of age memoir. I thought of it as a coming of age memoir um, that had a really unflinching uh, look at, I guess, sexuality and self worth, and also female friendship is a huge part of it too, which I found really fascinating and with an extremely assured voice on the page. Which yep. uh, for people listening and thinking, how do I get this voice? You know, Emily has has made it clear and we'll probably tell you more about the fact that it was a process of refining um, and rewriting and redrafting and going from self-deprecating emails to, you know, the assured voice is not a snap necessarily. No, no, very time consuming and, and quite a journey, quite a journey. Um, one thing I think probably a really good thing for us to move into now is is really thinking about where do how do we get our ideas how do we how do we find ideas how do we formulate um, a book proposal and because I think you know it it's it's often an unusual thing for somebody to come with a fully developed manuscript um, so perhaps we'll take it back one step and sort of talk through um, how we go about finding these ideas. So um, I might throw to Arwen first, just uh, some, some tips and things for, um, for young writers, emerging writers, um, about where to, where's the best place to get your uh, non-fiction book ideas, narrative non-fiction. Probably the same place I get my non-fiction book ideas, but I'm not <laughs> writing them. Uh, the world, being, being a curious and um, voracious reader and consumer of media and being aware of what cultural trends are out there, what interesting things are happening in the world. It doesn't have to be, you know, politics or current affairs, anything like that. It really um, can be uh, to do with, you know, culture, society, um, mm -hmm. even science or economics. You know, I, I published a book a couple of years ago that was a pop economics book. Um, I didn't even really think I understood economics, but the author was able to communicate it in such a, a lucid way. So yep. that's it. Do you have something, do you have an idea out there that hasn't been addressed before or is it an existing idea or something that we know about and you have a fresh angle and a new take on it, um, which is I think what Emily had with her book and also the idea that memoir is something that you can only write when you've got 40 or 50 years of life experience under your belt is total bullshit. Yep. Uh, if you have an interesting point of view or an experience that you think is of value uh, and can provide insight into what it means to be human that others mm -hmm. will understand, then you can write a memoir. Yeah, uh, I think that's um, an incredibly important thing to acknowledge and also too from my point of view whenever I'm reading um, narrative nonfiction, you know, I think you know, I, I've recently read the arsonist, um, the Chloe Hooper's book, and I just the the way that I imagine that came to her being interested in the whole idea of arson and the whole idea of Black Saturday, and then and then sort of getting behind that idea and thinking about how she was going to bring her own her own take and perspective on that. So I think um, 
and I think research is, you know, that is an incredibly important part of that. But also to finding something that you're passionate about, something that absolutely speaks to you and that you're very, very passionate about and that you're prepared to then um, fashion that into something that is going to be uh, of interest to other people and interest to a publisher. Um, research is a good point, Tracy. I think, it, yeah, it, books don't always have to have research, but certain topics you will have to do a deep dive. You will have to have evidence to prove your point. If you're making a, a new contention about something, then, you know, where is that information coming from and what evidence do you have to put forward for it? Uh, or maybe you have an extraordinary life experience, which is an obvious way to write something. It could be that it's a hybrid memoir. Um, where your life experience dovetails into uh, a broader industry or a broader idea or a broader, um, I'm trying to think of, uh, there's an author who I'm publishing next year who discovered she was donor conceived in her late 20s, but then she also decided that she would dig into the fertility industry. So it's that marriage of, of a kind of bigger picture investigation with her personal story. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so... I know we touched on this before, but I'm going to move now into talking about the synopsis. So, uh, and, and we're going to sort of try and get some hard-won tips in here for um, for our listeners. And but Emily, I just wondered if you would like to read a little bit, uh, a section from your synopsis for us um, as a way of setting this up. For us. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, so as Arwen mentioned, um, I pitched to her at the Emerging Writers Festival in a speed pitching event. Um, everyone here who is applying for the Spark Prize is in a great position because you can write down what you would say in person and edit it as opposed to it coming out of my mouth in this case, completely unedited. Um, so <laughs> while I was talks about leaving that pitch with a great impression, I left with an almost certain feeling that there was no way I was gonna be contacted because I felt like I hadn't represented at least verbally what I wanted to say. So the synopsis, it was a great thing to be able to leave that at least and be, you know, say like, oh, my page is there, at least she, you know, maybe she'll, she'll see something there that's worth uh, emailing me about. Um, my synopsis was also half a page. Mm -hmm. I noticed with the scribe prize, you get the luxury of a full page. Um, <laughs> so use I it wisely. Make, yes, use it wisely. Uh, so I wrote, um, The Lotus Eaters is a coming-of-age memoir set between Sydney and Hanoi. I am 19 years old. After an explosive argument with my best friend of six years leaves me stranded overseas, I arrive in Vietnam and almost immediately stumble into an oppressive relationship with the hotel bellboy. My sense of self-worth circles men, my body, men in my body like a drain. I travel back to Laos for a visa run in mid-April. After a night of partying, I narrowly avoid gang rape in a Laotian hotel. The incident marks a spiralling down of self-worth that leaves me insecure in my own right to say no. The patterns of blame and shame, first imprinted in adolescence, etch themselves into a new context. In Hanoi, I leave my controlling bellboy boyfriend for another who assaults me in the middle of the night. The second relationship ends in May after I travel to Sapa and sleep with a local bartender. The bartender, with criminal connections, turns up in Hanoi and abducts me. He keeps me in his rural hometown until I lie to him and tell him that, yes, I will move to Sapa with him. When I return to Hanoi, my motorbike runs out of petrol. I go back home with the man who offers to help. I learn that sex is both a symptom and a cure for a deep fear burrowed in my gut of something I do not know the name of. So that's half a page. Um, if I had a full page, I would maybe expand a little bit um, and maybe touch a little bit more on theme. Uh, yep. It's really hard half a page to kind of touch on all the different uh, points of the plot that kind of, you know, on which the story uh, swivels. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt that it was really important to get, um, because I did, I, because I wasn't coming in with a strong sense of a hook. Um, mm -hmm. I have had a publisher tell me before that you cannot t write a memoir unless you're famous or you chopped your own leg off on top of a mountain. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> which I'm sure, you know, just through the process of this event, uh, we've definitely debunked. But nevertheless, I felt like uh, I was quite conscious of my selling point. What is my selling point? And I think yep. um, I'm quite confident in my voice and my writing as delivering the ideas that I want to put on the page. So I wanted to make sure that in my synopsis, there was a sense of my voice and there was a sense of 
how I would be writing about these uh, these events and how uh, it would pull the reader through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. And you've really touched on a couple of things. So themes, um, hook and voice. So there's some really important aspects to think about um, with your synopsis. Arwen, what, what are... What are some other things that you think from a, a publisher's point of view that, that a good synopsis looks like? And then also to what a terrible one looks like? Uh, too much detail can be completely mm -hmm. overwhelming. You lose sight of what the point of difference is. And you as an author should be really clear on what your point of difference is. As Emily just said, you knew what your point of difference was uh, with what you were trying to do. You need to communicate that in the synopsis. Um, and that might be through the events themselves or it might be through the themes. You could be explicit about it uh, or it might be implicit in what you're writing. It has to have a point of difference. So I understand what will make this book memorable and why people will pick it up and pass it to their friends and say, you must read this. Absolutely, yes. And um, fantastic. So I think there's some really good um really good tips in there about how to do your synopsis. But once again, I think the value in all of this is to do a draft, write, write a draft really, anything that you want to write about it, write a draft and then start honing that and making it clearer and sort of bringing it back to those key things, which is your the hook or your selling point for the thing, what the theme and really what the theme you are going to explore. And through that, you'll also be um, exhibiting to the publisher your voice so that will come through with that too all right i think um what i'd like to do now is move on to the next part of the submission which is the chapter outline and and probably the first question um, and i'd like to ask to ask you is talking about what the purpose of the chapter outline is and so why it's important and, and what it can do differently to the synopsis the synopsis is you mapping out your narrative arc briefly and also thinking about what themes you want to cover and your point of difference, as we just discussed. Uh, the chapter outline forces you to get real about what you're actually going to write and how you're going to write it. And it might be that it changes entirely. You will not be held to this. You will not be signing a contract in blood to say that this chapter outline that you submit for an idea will be the shape of the book. But mm -hmm. it, I think, allows you as a writer to think about how you're going to tackle what you're going to tackle and how you will plot that narrative arc. If it's personal events, then how are you going to shape that? What are you going to show and what are you not going to show and how are you going to structure it in each chapter? If it's an investigation, how will that unfold? And you may not know. There might be things that you discover in the process of writing or investigating or researching that come to light. So this is what I mean about it not being, you know, the 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 concrete version of the book, but I yep. think it really... Um, gives you the opportunity to think about how you want to hang it all together and what you want to leave the reader with, what the end of the book, you know, what do you think it might be if you haven't done research yet? What are you hoping to prove? Yeah, for sure. I think also too an important thing that the chapter outline can do is help you see that you've got you've got a story, you've got you've got enough research or information to make it into a book as opposed to something much shorter because a book is a, is a marathon, not a sprint, um, and and obviously um, the chapter outline, it also shows whether or not you've done your research, whether or not you've actually got, um, you've got behind the subject and, and you can show to somebody else that you've got enough in there. I think... I completely uh, agree with that, Tracy. I think you're absolutely on point. I think uh, so much of the time... Uh, you read a great long form article and I think that's amazing. Maybe it could be a book, but does it really have the legs to go for a book? Maybe it is fantastic as a long form article. And when you actually have to plot out what you're going to put in every single chapter, it, you, it might become clear that you have m more than enough material for two books or maybe it is just a fantastic long form article. Yeah. And, and I mean, with this, we've got the we've got three thousand words for your chapter outline. So, I mean, one of the things with that is to is to have a rough go at what you think your structure might be like, and then and then sort of think about how many words you've got left, and you know what you're going to say about each each one's each bit of that piece. So, 
I think um, the main thing with the chapter outline is it just demonstrates those that you understand what your book is about and also too that it has sufficient in there to be something that's longer than, as you say, a long form um, article. Any other, Emily, I don't think you had to do a chapter outline in, in relation to your book, um, but have you got any other thoughts you'd like to add to, um, into, to this section of the discussion? Uh, I didn't have to do a chapter outline for um, for my pitch, but I did one for my own for like my own benefit earlier on in the drafting process. Mm -hmm. um, it's really it's particularly useful uh, if your if your book uh, incorporates multiple timelines or multiple themes. Yes, uh, just to really see it uh, laid out in an A4 kind of way. Uh, I think particularly uh, through university and even high school or beyond that, we become used to working in smaller form. So a thousand words, 2000 words, and it be can be harder to wrangle like the structure of what can be 70,000 words or a hundred thousand words and actually really see the big picture of it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people recommend, you know, printing everything out and looking at it on the floor, but a chapter mm -hmm. outline can let you do that in a, a uh, little bit of a less fuss way uh, and you can really it's really helpful just as a writer to be able to see what what keeps coming up what is maybe uh, being flogged a little bit too hard what can be moved around uh, what the what the arcs are and what you can do to really like bring those out in a way that um, services the narrative fantastic thank you um, okay so we're now going to uh, move on to the biggest bit um, of the of the submission, which is really the sample work in progress. So I would just I might just throw to you to just talk to um, probably what does a model sample chapter look like? What I mean, what are you what are you looking for in that? It doesn't necessarily have to be the beginning of your book, especially if you already have a book in progress. I'm looking for something that will best show uh, your voice on the page and will show us how you are able to, if we have your chapter structure, we can look and say, okay, so this was chapter five, mm -hmm. which is dealing with these issues. How are they addressed in that chapter? How is it put together? What's the because if we're talking about a narrative arc for the whole book, each chapter also has a narrative arc. Um, think of it even as a mini book that you are sending through. So the, the chapter sample that you send through is an opportunity for you to show us that you understand or that you have an idea of how to put your narrative arc in place, even on 3,000 words or 2,000 words. Yeah, and, and I suppose it's also um, a really good indicator of the author's style, so understanding what, what their voice looks like and how, and how they write. And um, how, how important is it for you uh, when you're reading a sample chapter in terms of things like it being proofread or, um, you know, it being not littered with errors and things like that? Is that important to you at all? At this point? Look, ideally, you know, uh, it would be proofread, but uh, who hasn't put something out into the world with a typo yes. or two in it? It's definitely, you know, not a deal breaker to have no, errors. No. Please do not, please do not feel stressed if you send something in and then Absolutely. realize afterwards there's a typo in it. Yeah. Um, it, it's yeah, it's part of the course. As long as there is uh, care and attention to the the thought that goes into it, you know, the the words on the typos are less important than the thought. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. So really what we're what a sample chapter is really trying to do is it's it's showing the it's showing your writing style, the author's voice, it's demonstrating to the publisher that you understand how how a narrative works, um, and it's also choosing something that's going to be interesting and captivating and hold the publisher's interest. Would that be a fair thing? Absolutely. Summary? It's the only thing where it's the only part of your book that we'll be reading. So think about what will best capture our attention. Fantastic. Okay, I think we are probably going to move now into some some of the kind of uh, the smaller bits of the um, proposal. However, some of them are pretty important. Um, we're, you've got to think about the title of the of the um, proposal. And so thinking about that, 
just making sure that um, you come up with something that is descriptive, um, but also to making sure that it isn't something um, that uh, that is going to put the put the publisher off or put somebody off. Are there any other good or decent tips, Arwen, or funny project titles that you've that have come to you that you've kind of um, that you'd like to share with us? Uh, funny project titles. Um, I, someone sent me one saying it was called Proof of Life, uh, which was basically just to prove that they were actually writing the book that I had contracted them to write. Uh, I do love a subtitle. If you're writing a book that lends yep. itself to a subtitle, um, I love to see a subtitle. It doesn't have to be, you know, with both the title and subtitle, it's a working title. But it's I really like to see a title that might um, be a little bit more evocative or imaginative in some way and then a subtitle that lets us know what the book is about. I think that that, you know, you'd, if you're writing a book about, um, I'm trying to think, science, you don't necessarily have to have science in the book title. That's mm -hmm. what a subtitle can do. I love to see chapter titles as well, working titles, just so that we have a, an idea. If you want to have chapter titles, you may not necessarily, but it really helps, especially with only one or two chapters that you might be sending through as part of your sample for me to quickly get a sense of what you think the topic of that particular chapter is. Yep, fantastic. Emily, how did you go with trying with finding a book title for the Lotus Eaters? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I think it just came to me um, in a, you know, lightning bolt of inspiration, as they say, um, and I was extremely excited uh, because I felt like it encompassed um, a bunch of themes that I was wrestling with. Um, it's quite evocative as, uh, you know, like Lotus has a lot of symbolic resonance. Um, we think of uh, spirituality, but we also think of, uh, you know, the flower as a kind of symbol of like feminine sexuality in a lot of ways. And then eating is like a way of consummation and also a kind of devouring and uh, changing. Uh, so I was quite excited when it came to me in that sense. And then I went and Googled it and found that, and that's from there that I found that it had that uh, link to the Homeric uh, Odyssey, which, you know, actually I was both pleased with and not pleased with because I felt like it changed my initial meaning. But at the same time, it's just a new layer of, you know, hedonism and travel and things that really uh, correlated nicely with what what I wanted the title to do. Um, I think I was open to it changing. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't too precious about it. Uh, and I did bring it up with Arwen whether um, whether Hardy Grant had any other, you know, had a different idea about it than I did. But I think we were all pretty much on the same page that that was what it would go under. Excellent. Fantastic. And, and let it be noted that there is no subtitle for Emily's book either. Maybe it says a memoir, but, uh, you know, it could easily not say a memoir. Yeah. Fantastic. Excellent. I, all right. We've got, we've probably got about 10 minutes um, left. And so I really want now to open out to the um, questions, the audience questions. So thank you both. Um, Emily and Arwen, and some of these questions will be for you, so stick around. Um, but thank you for that. It was incredibly illuminating and really, really helpful, I think, to our audience just to go through those different parts of the submission. Um, I'm going to throw across to Zoe for our question time. Sure. So we have a ton of questions, as you're probably aware. Um, so we'll try and move through, through them as quickly as possible, and I'm sure they're going to keep coming in. So um, one of the questions we've received a couple of times is about um, whether it's appropriate to use first or third person in um, in the synopsis. So whether people should be writing in first or third person, um, or if that matters at all. From my point of view, I don't mind. Mm -hmm. Great. It's okay. neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, a great synopsis either way. 
Mm, fantastic. Um, and there are some a lot of questions about the structure of the chapter outline. So um, do you, in your mind, what is sort of the convention there? Is it um, sort of structured as, you know, there are many sort of synopses, um, bullet points, uh, subheads, sort of how does that work or look? What's the sort of, what are the nuts and bolts there of the, of the chapter outline has broken down? Uh, great question. I don't want to be too prescriptive with this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think actually it could be that it is a mini synopsis for each chapter. It could be that it's bullet points. It could be a combo of both, like a sense or two to introduce the theme of chapter and then bullet point talking about what exactly you'll address. Um, as long as we can see clearly the how the chapters flow and fit together, possibly mm -hmm. with chapter titles, what you do within that is is it can be any of those things. Like I said, I don't want to have a hard and fast rule about what you must necessarily have. Mm -hmm. So it's just really about delivering as much information as you possibly can. Um, so you understand the shape of the book or the plan for the book. Is that the sort of leading objective there? Mm -hmm. That's right. I don't, I imagine that it probably wouldn't be more, I know that we have a word limit on it as well. Um, but it might be, you know, two pages, possibly even one page. It really, it depends how much detail you want to go into with the word count that we have for that. But um, how you go about expressing what's in each chapter is up to you. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, so another question we've had, um, which is sort of less directly related to the prize, but just more about pitching to Hardy Grant in general. Um, a couple of people are curious to know how they might go about sort of um, pitching their book to um, to Hardy Grant, not via the Spark Prize? And whether, is that normally done via an agent? Do you, do you accept manuscript submissions? Do you accept pitches? How does that work? We, we don't actually have, we of course we accept pitches from agents, but we also mm -hmm. accept a ton of pitches not from agents as well. We don't have a formal um, email address for submissions. Sometimes they come via our lovely receptionist, Bernie. Shout out to Bernie if she's watching. Uh, <laughs> I, I think actually as we even talk about this, it would be a great idea to have a formal email set up for this. So that's something that I can definitely follow up and make it happen. Um, it, I know other publishers have uh, days that they accept it, like one day a month, and that's primarily to uh allow the editors to actually look at what comes in if we had an open email address every day of the year we would probably get 200,000 submissions a year or mm. some number like that and we just don't have the capacity to get through that number so i would love to look at something which is a once a month um submissions email address i will write it down right now <laughs> um so another question that we've had, and maybe this sort of comes back to the, you know, trying to define a form that is really slippery and difficult to define, narrative nonfiction. Um, and you did make a distinction between experimental nonfiction and narrative nonfiction um, in the beginning of the session, Arlen. Um, how, like, what, how much scope is there to experiment within narrative nonfiction in terms of, um, you know, unconventional approaches to organising the narrative or time, for example, as it occurs um, in in the work. Um, how, like, what are the limits there for experimentation or unconventional approaches to telling a nonfiction um, story that sort of um, that don't kind of uh, then sort of that, that aren't necessarily experimental, if, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one to define. Um, you know, with everything, there's a kind of a spectrum, right? There's not like a hard and fast line in the sand where I say, right, I'm not accepting that because it's experimental. There are a ton of things that get published under the auspices of narrative nonfiction, which might play with uh, form or voice. Uh, or, I mean, if you think of Maria Tumarkin's book, Axiomatic, I think was, was published by The Lifted Brow and probably would fall under experimental nonfiction. But actually, in some ways, because that has been such a success, it's kind of broadened the idea of what narrative nonfiction is now. Um, so I say, if you have an idea, um, put it down. If it is perhaps uh, in verse, uh, it might be uh, tricky to define that as narrative nonfiction since that would normally fall under poetry, as you would know, Zoe. Um, but I think 
we want to be open to to different ways of telling stories. I don't want people. I don't want to be prescriptive, and I don't want people to um, not give it a crack. Fantastic. Um, so we have. I think we have time for. I mean, there's just two more quick questions. Um, so. What is the general like for the for a finished manuscript? So, what is generally is there like a, a a word count for what would be for a final book in narrative nonfiction form, or is that again like there's it's a spectrum? How long's a, a piece of string? What's the sort of working a average there? Yeah, sorry, I'm giving you these spectrum answers all of the time. No, People it, want, but it want is definitive answers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, hard own. and fast rules. Exactly. It, it is hard and fast, and yeah. I would at this point actually really direct everyone listening to the. Um, I think it's on the RMIT writing website, or there's there's documentation which has a huge bunch of narrative nonfiction titles that you can go and have a look at. I would urge you to have a look at them. I would urge you to go to your local bookshop if you're not in Melbourne and can actually go to a bookshop. And go and browse the nonfiction section and really have a look and see at the breadth of what's out there. Um, coming back to your question, which I have momentarily forgotten, Zoe, please remind me. Length. Oh, if, if there is in your mind. Length. Yes. Your length. <laughs> Thank you. Um, look, I think for, for narrative nonfiction, it's hard to tell a story very briefly. I would be... I'm not sure I've seen much narrative nonfiction that's under 50,000 words. Mm -hmm. uh, the average is probably 70 or 80,000 words, but they can go right up to 120, 130,000 in some cases when you're talking about really big books that cover a lot of research. Um, so be prepared to put a fair few words down on the page, I would say. I would like to see people able to put together at least 50,000 words on a particular topic. Yep, fantastic. All right, I think that's sort of, that means we're out of time for questions in this session, but as Tracy said, we'll be collating all of the questions and we'll be putting together an FAQ um, that will be on the Bond Street Press website and on the Honey Grant website spark page. So any questions that have been answered here, please check back and, um, and we'll have answered them there. Um, so thank you very much though, it's so great to see as many people engaged and um, I wish we could answer everyone's questions here and now but we will get to them. Absolutely, fantastic. All right, well I think it's about time for us to wrap up um, today and I just want to do um, a couple of thank yous. I'd like to thank um, Alison Barker and Elise Barton for all their work behind the scenes in helping us set this up. Um, obviously great Big thanks to Ronnie Scott and Arwen Summers for um, conceiving of this prize. It's just extraordinary and we've got so much wonderful interest. Um, I'd like to thank our guests today, um, Arwen again, and also Emily. Thank you so much for giving us your time and giving us insights into um, the wonderful book, The Lotus Eaters. It's been really, really fun, lots of fun hearing all about it. And, Thank you to my colleague Zoe, um, also too, for helping um, put all this together and um, making it such a great event. So I think I think that's it. I think we're all done and dusted. But um, thanks to all of you, to the audience, for all of your interest. And hopefully we get some amazing, wonderful and diverse uh, narrative nonfiction proposals um, coming through to Hardy Grant. We're all looking very much forward to the, um, to the judging. It'll be fantastic.